Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the third in our webinar series with David Ackert, Building a Powerful Referral Network. Before I introduce David, a couple of housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded, and we'll be distributing the recording and a copy of the slides in the next day or two. Everyone is muted throughout the webinar, but we will have time for questions at the end, so please enter these at any time in the chat box on your screen, and I'll share them with David at the end of the session. We will, be all, we will also be hosting our fourth and final webinar in this series with David on August 11th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The webinar will cover how to motivate the next generation of rainmakers. Our speaker today is David Ackert, who has over 15 years of experience as a business development consultant to lawyers. He has personally developed and implemented client development programs for hundreds of firms, from regional boutiques to some of the top AMLA 100s. Through his company, Ackert Inc., he has created award-winning platforms including Practice Boomers, an e-learning program that teaches rainmaking to lawyers, and Practice Pipeline, a platform that helps lawyers keep their most important relationships top of mind. You can more, learn more about his programs at ackertinc.com. David's work has garnered press from such publications as the LA Times, the National Review, the Los Angeles Business Journal, the Wall Street Journal, and the Daily Journal. He's spoken at LMA, ABA, and state bar conferences, and been the keynote speaker at numerous conferences on the topic of client development. He is a guest lecturer at the USC Marshall School of Business and at the UCLA School of Law. So without further ado, David, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and welcome everyone to the program. Uh, before I dive in, I just wanted to take a moment and uh, speak to this image that we chose to kick off this program because uh, ultimately building a powerful referral network, as we will be discussing today, uh, requires first and foremost finding the people who will be in that network and then finding the opportunities that are available through that network. So ultimately, uh, a lot of the process of networking requires seeking out opportunities and really looking out into the horizon and finding that which ultimately will serve your uh, agenda. People sometimes forget this. They look at networking as, well, yeah, I'm just gonna have lunch with this person and coffee with that person, and hopefully sooner or later, uh, some business will come my way. Uh, and today, hopefully by the end of the program, we'll make a pretty strong case for why it's important to treat this like any business endeavor with a goal in mind, looking downstream and approaching it a little more strategically so that the results that you get are both effective and efficient. So this should be a fairly familiar concept for you. One of the most common patterns among lawyer networking is this proactive, reactive pendulum. And what that means is that when there is uh, enough work on your desk, in your practice, suddenly networking and business development starts to become a pretty low priority. Uh, and so the pendulum swings to one extreme. You find yourself very busy. Uh, it's easy to come up with the excuse of, well, you know, I, I can always tap my network if I need them, but for now I seem to be doing pretty well and I'm just going to keep my head down and focus on all of this uh, billable work and, and the client priorities that I have uh, currently engaging my time and focus. But then the pendulum swings in the other direction and suddenly there's this frantic search for new opportunities. Oh my goodness, I better fill my calendar with lunches and breakfasts and, and uh, mixers and, and better reconnect with my network because as I look down the horizon, I see that I don't have as much work as I would have hoped. Perhaps the case I was working on settled before I thought it would or perhaps uh, I uh, have found myself finally uh, tapering off of a complex matter that I was working on with a client or Perhaps I just lost a client, God forbid, but that happens too. And so there's this inconsistency that goes on. The pendulum swings back and forth, and this is a reactive model. We are either reacting to the fact that we have enough business and don't feel like we really need to tap our network, or we're uh, suddenly being proactive, but even that is reactive to the fact that suddenly there isn't uh, much business. So in order for us to have a more stable, consistent practice, we need to consistently nurture our business networks, even during the busy times. Because we all know that the lunch that you have or the breakfast that you have with your referral source or your prospective client today 
probably won't yield a new piece of business for weeks, months, perhaps even years. So it's not like all of a sudden you can turn on the faucet and have a bounty of new opportunities pour into your lap. You have to make sure that you are constantly nurturing your network, uh, even during the times when perhaps you feel that it's not as much of a priority if, in fact, you want this consistent stream of uh, business to come your way. So that's what brings us to today's agenda. We're going to cover four uh, key items here. One is to help you identify productive referral sources because, as you no doubt know, not all referral sources are created equally. We need to deepen those existing business relationships and do it efficiently so that networking doesn't end up becoming a very time and labor intensive endeavor. We need to find out how to gain access to influencers and business decision makers through our network of referral sources. And finally, learn some follow-up strategies so that we can get beyond what everyone else does, which is just sort of keep me in mind. You know, we've got a relationship. We have a business referral understanding. So why don't you just keep me in mind? I'll do the same for you, and hopefully something will happen. We're going to go beyond that and come up with some proactive uh, uh, strategies for you. So let's start with number one, how to identify a productive referral source. Now, everyone who is in the webinar today has a business network, whether these are people with whom you went to law school or people with whom you grew up or people that you've met through the business community, uh, people who've been introduced to you, people who share membership in various groups and associations with you. You have a business community, and if you don't believe me, just look on your LinkedIn page. Hopefully, you've got a few connections there that are representative of uh, the individuals with whom you've made some sort of connection. But not all of those connections are going to be good referral sources. And the trouble is we don't actually know who's going to be a good referral source. If we did, we would just focus on those relationships instead of having to manage a whole host of dozens, if not hundreds of people through platforms like LinkedIn and through random acts of lunch. So it looks something like this. All right, let's say that this picture here is a representation of my business community. Uh, there's this gentleman who's standing in the foreground uh, with a suit and no tie smiling at me. Uh, his name, let's say, is George. Uh, George is a, uh, a lawyer. He's a non-competing lawyer with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, on paper, he should be able to send work my way. Perhaps he is a litigator and I'm a transactional lawyer and there should be some cross-referral opportunity there. Or even if we're competing lawyers, maybe he gets conflicted out of a matter and he sends it my way. So I guess I should have lunch with George because you never know. Maybe he'll keep me in mind. And then there's the woman to George's right or to our left. She's standing in the center there on that puzzle piece. Uh, her name is Sally, let's say. And Sally is an accountant, and she's uh, a new partner in an accounting firm. Accountants certainly, uh, especially at her firm, have access to the kinds of clientele that I'd be interested in. And since they don't do any legal whatsoever, there's no competitive overlap here. So I should probably have lunch with Sally, too, on a fairly regular basis and make sure that she keeps me in mind. Because you never know. One of her clients may need a legal matter that would be appropriate to my firm or to my practice. So, all right, I'll spend some time with Sally so she keeps me in mind because you never know. And then there's the gentleman over here in the pink shirt. He's a consultant. Uh, his name is Kim. And I should probably have lunch with Kim, too, because you never know. He can keep me in mind. He's consulting clients who might have a legal matter. and Maybe he'll be able to identify something and send it my way. Now, hopefully by this point, this is starting to sound pretty redundant. I'm doing this intentionally because this is what networking is like. We do a lot of sitting down with people so that they'll keep us in mind because you never know. Someday they may encounter uh, a prospective client opportunity, and we don't really know where our next referral is going to come from most of the time. So we have lunch after lunch and breakfast after breakfast and drinks after drinks, and then we attend these various uh, mixers and, and association meetings in the hopes that we finally weed through all of these people and find what we're ultimately looking for which is a short list of productive referral sources. Maybe there's just a few of them as compared to all of these people that we know. But it's a little bit of a, 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 it's like a dating game. You date a whole lot of people in the hopes that you find one or two people that you can actually have a more sustained relationship with. But here's the problem. You never know 
is not a strategy. And keep me in mind is certainly not a close. And ultimately, that's what we want. We want to be strategic and we want to close business. We want to bring business opportunities into the practice so that we can bring on new clients and do what we do best with them. And networking is a very inefficient way of getting to that result, unless you have some sort of system. So one of the first things I'm going to share with you by way of a takeaway is a system that I call the four C's. And this is really a set of criteria that you can use to identify an effective referral source without having to go through this very inefficient sifting process of going through, you know, all of these different people, sitting down with them, telling them what you do, learning what they do, and then having to do it over and over and over again so that they keep you top of line. The four C's are chemistry, commerce, competence, and collaboration. We'll go through each of these in more detail. Chemistry is critical when you are trying to identify a productive referral source because if you don't like the person, it's not likely that you'll be able to sustain a referral relationship with them. Even if on paper they seem like someone who should be able to refer business your way and so you think to yourself, okay, I guess that's a good person for me to invest time in, that's really not going to be something that you can do ongoingly if you don't really genuinely like them. Uh, you're going to find that the next time they propose a get-together, you just don't feel like it, and you're a little busy anyway, and maybe you should just put that off. Or if you, uh, it comes time for you to send them a piece of business because they've sent you a piece of business, you have a hesitation because, you know what, you don't really like them, and so maybe the client that you sent won't like them either. So these kinds of considerations are not going to be helpful to you when developing a long-term referral relationship. Make sure that the chemistry is there. You're going to understand whether or not the chemistry is there within a few seconds of meeting them. So let's say you're at a, uh, a networking function of some sort, maybe it's an association of lawyers or maybe it's a business networking group and you've arrived at the meeting and you run into someone and you shake hands, you meet them, and then the first few seconds, you pretty much know if you like them. Do they leave a positive impression on you or not? So let's assume that they do and the chemistry is there and you decide to move on to Assessing commerce. Now, commerce is critical because if this person doesn't have access to the commerce opportunities that are going to be uh, providing a productive business result, then this really isn't a referral source. This is somebody maybe you can uh, be friends with but not necessarily have a business relationship with. So you've got to identify commerce, and you want to do that within the first few seconds because, again, uh, this is uh, the, the objective here is to do this whole process efficiently. So you might ask them a question like, well, what do you do? And they'll say, oh, I'm an accountant or I'm a lawyer or I am a CFO or whatever they say. Now, you want to make sure that you don't just settle for their answer. This is, if anything, an interview process. Imagine that you are building a new firm, and you've got to populate the firm with the right people. And so you're going to be asking the kinds of interview questions to make sure that you get the right people populating your firm. Well, the same is true when it comes to building a referral source network. You don't have enough time to meet with all of the people in your network. You have a limited number, a short list, if you will of people that you're looking to compile here. So you have to interview the people that you're meeting so that you can identify if, in fact, they're going to be suitable for this short list. So if they say, I'm an accountant, then you can ask them some follow-on questions. Really, tell me a little bit about the kinds of clients that you work with. Uh, and tell me a little bit about the size of company that you work with. And tell me a little bit about your firm and the kinds of opportunities that come your way. See, these are all interview questions that you would need to ask them because just because they say you're an accountant doesn't mean that that's going to be an appropriate opportunity for you. And you really don't want to have lunch with this person and spend an entire hour investing your time and getting to know them only to learn by the end of that lunch that the kinds of clients that they work with are too small for your practice or they already have an existing relationship with another lawyer and all of their referrals are going to go there anyway. So these are the kinds of things that you want to try to uh, gain an understanding of within the first few seconds of meeting someone. Now this seems obvious, but let me challenge you on this. Here's how most networking conversations go. Uh, hi, what's your name? Oh, my name is Bill, and I would say, great, Bill, my name is David. Um, Bill, tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm an accountant. Oh, really? That's really interesting. Um, 
Bill, tell me, uh, an accountant, where, where do you practice? And Bill might say, oh, I practice at Smith & Smith. Smith & Smith, I know Mary over at Smith & Smith. Do you know Mary? And he says, absolutely, Mary and I work closely together. And then I might say something like, gosh, you know, I think Mary just, Mary, Mary just uh, had her, her first child, didn't she? Oh, yes, I saw the baby pictures. And here we are, Bill and I are off and running, talking about Mary's personal life uh, and spending the first few minutes with that sort of chit-chat that doesn't necessarily uh, get us much closer to identifying if there's a business synergy here. Now, I'm not suggesting that that kind of uh, dialogue isn't important. Obviously, you want to get to know them, you want to create rapport, and all of that is critical. But make sure that in, in the same breath, you are also establishing uh, enough evidence that you want to move forward and invest more time with Bill. Because otherwise, what can easily happen is you find yourself sitting down with Bill without enough information, and that ends up being uh, a lunch that goes nowhere, which could even be followed by several other lunches that go nowhere before you finally realize, you know what, I probably should have uh, invested that time elsewhere rather than spending all that time with Bill. David, so, can we just pause for one second? Absolutely. Uh, we can't see your slides anymore. Oh, okay. Can Let's you reach it? your desktop? Might be. Yeah. I know it's hard to get me to uh, shut up once I get started, so I completely <laughs> No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> completely appreciate. There we How's go. That? Perfect. All right, we're back. Perfect. Thank could you, you so them? much. Could could you see them earlier? Yes, and then they disappeared. Okay. All right, good. Well, let's Great, uh, pick you. up where we left off. Okay, All right, so perfect. here we are. Here we are with Bill having a little chit-chat. We've decided within the first couple of minutes of meeting Bill that there is, in fact, commerce potential. Now we need to move on to the third C, which is competence. Uh, assessing your referral source's competence uh, is incredibly important because otherwise what you're going to find yourself with is a one-way street. If you have convinced them of your competence, but you are not convinced of their competence, then you will hesitate to send them any business. And that means that sooner or later you're going to find yourself in a dynamic where uh, they are sending you work and you're not sending any back and now you're a taker and you're not a giver and that's not really going to serve their interest. So uh, you need to make sure that in order for this to be a sustainable, symbiotic, cross-referral relationship, that you have a sense of their competence and you have a sense of it fairly early on. Now this is tricky, right? Because you're not going to hire them. Uh, you're not going to hire Bill to do your accounting necessarily. So how would you know that Bill is a competent accountant? I mean, I suppose the fact that he works at Smith & Smith helps because perhaps you know something about that firm. But it's uh, just as likely that he's someone that you wouldn't necessarily send any clients to. So this is going to require that you do sit down with him. Now, you've already established that there's chemistry and there's commerce potential, so uh, it's time to take this person out to lunch, a cup of coffee, a breakfast, whatever it might be, a drink, and uh, assess their competence. And you'll do that by asking questions like, tell me about your background, and uh, tell me about some of the professional challenges that you've had to date. Again, if they're willing to share some of their challenges and how they overcame them, you're going to start to get a sense of how this person thinks. Now, it's very easy for Bill uh, to represent himself as a competent accountant or professional. We're all good at that. We all know how to say the right things to kind of give you a sense of, oh, well, I'm impressed by you, because we've practiced this over and over again in our own networking. So don't just settle for whatever Bill has to say about a description of his practice. You want to start asking questions. Again, this is an interview. You're interviewing someone for a coveted position in your referral network. And in order for that to be an effective process, you want to come to the table with uh, questions that are really going to help you walk away from that meeting with a sense that you, you really believe that this person is competent. And you've asked them maybe a couple of tricky questions that aren't so easy to answer so that when you send a client over to Bill and the client comes to them with a tricky situation, that you have the confidence that Bill is going to be able to navigate that effectively. All right, so let's assume that this lunch goes well, you have a sense of their competence, you're already confident about the chemistry and the commerce, now we move to the fourth and perhaps one of the most important characteristics of a productive referral source, and that's collaborative. In fact, you want to make sure they have a collaborative mindset and that they think the same way that you do when it comes to exchanging referrals. 
many people, and I would even endeavor to say most lawyers and certainly professionals in general, have this attitude of, well, if you send me a referral and I do a good job with the client that you sent me, then that should be thanks enough. So just keep sending me referrals and I'll make sure that I do a good job for your client. But let me tell you that that is the minimum requirement. Of course you're gonna do a good job for their client. They wouldn't have trusted you with their client if they thought anything less than that. But there's no incentive for them to keep sending clients to you if the only quid pro quo that you have to offer is doing your job. So as a responsible, proactive, long-term, collaborative referral source, you need to make sure that you are sending business back their way. Now, the same thing goes for them. And this is part of what you're assessing at this point. You've assessed that they, there's chemistry. You've assessed that there's commerce potential. You've assessed that they have competence. Now you need to assess, are they collaborative? If you send them something, are they going to uh, respond in kind? And the best way to do this, rather than send them a client, I mean, you just met this person, it's probably a little too early to do that, and you may not have a piece of business on your desk to refer to them. So give them something of value that may have nothing to do with a client referral. Perhaps it's an article that you've recently written that you think uh, they'd find interesting, or uh, perhaps it's a gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness. We'll get into that in a moment. Or perhaps it is uh, a, an introduction to another professional who they might find useful in their network. And then pay attention to how they respond to that. Do they acknowledge your gesture? Do they thank you? Do they try to send something of value in return? That's the key. Because how they operate here is how they're going to operate when it comes time for you to exchange clients down the road. People's uh, inclination, their nature, their proclivities don't change from situation to situation. If they are selfish in one context, they're likely to be selfish in another context. So you wanna kinda of test the waters a little bit now that you've met them, you've had lunch with them, you've invested some time with them, because part of what you're assessing is, am I gonna put you on that short list that's going to imply that I sit down with you on a regular basis, send you referrals, send you introductions, because I have some confidence here that you are going to be collaborative in your efforts to meet my expectations as a productive referral source relationship. So let's assume that the way that they respond to this thing that you send them is, uh, is uh, acceptable to you. Congratulations, they've gone through the four C's. And this process has only taken you a few seconds when you first met them to assess chemistry and commerce, and then one meeting to assess competence, and then the follow-up gives you collaboration. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you here is that in just uh, a very short period of time with a very minimal investment on your part, you should be able to assess if someone is going to make your short list of referral sources. The short list are the people who uh, are going to get consistent attention from you uh, where you're taking them out to lunch fairly consistently, where you're sending them opportunities. But if they don't make the four C's, then they don't get to be on that short list. And in this way, you start to identify those few people out of the, the, the larger network that you've amassed over time. So that's number one. You've identified productive referral sources from the people who you know, and you've done it in a fairly efficient manner. Now what we need to do is deepen existing business relationships. And the reason this is important is that here's how most people deepen existing business relationships. They spend a lot of time with those people. Now, again, I'm, I'm not against this, but if you're trying to go for an accelerated result here, uh, a business result, then you need to be uh, a little more thoughtful about how you accomplish this than simply clocking a whole lot of time with someone who may or may not end up being a productive relationship. Now, the way that this ends up looking is you meet Bill, you sit down with Bill, you decide that you like Bill, you decide that you're going to, you know, stay on Bill's radar and he's going to stay on yours. And then three months later, Bill invites you to uh, uh, go have golf with him. And so you do golf with Bill and there goes half of an afternoon right there, perhaps the whole afternoon. And then a few months go by and Bill says, hey, you know what, you know, we, we should do a double date. So you and your spouse, Bill and his spouse go and you know, you have a double date and you do dinner together and it's lovely and you really like Bill. 
Bill's a really nice guy, and you're spending all of this time with him. Now four years have gone by. And you've probably seen Bill once every four months, six months, something like that, spending a consistent amount of time with him. And congratulations, you have deepened your relationship with Bill. You would even consider Bill uh, a, a friend at this point, a business friend, but you haven't gotten any business from him. And this happens all the time because we invest all of this uh, time to deepen our relationship with our referral sources um, and it ends up being a very long-term endeavor. And even if you do get one piece of business from Bill after four years of investment, that's a lot of time to put in for our results. So how do we keep uh, deepening these relationships but doing them efficiently and doing them in a way that is meaningful and doing them in a way that is authentic? Well, one thing you may want to consider is this concept of the gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness. And I shared this idea briefly in one of my prior programs uh, on this webinar series, but I just want to touch on it again because it's extremely relevant in the context of building a powerful referral network. So the, re the, the way this works is um, it's really based on a, a, a story that I'm going to share with you. This happened uh, to me a few years ago. I was introduced to a lawyer named John through a mutual connection. And the connection said, you know, David, John, the two of you should sit down. You might have referrals for each other. You might be able to do some business together. So great. We sit down. We have lunch. And about uh, 15 minutes after we've gone through the, the usual platitudes of, so, you know, are you originally from the area? And goodness, wasn't traffic especially heavy today? And, you know, tell me a little bit about your practice, and I'll tell you a little about mine. We went through all of that. And then uh, John did something very interesting. He said to me, well, David, you know, fine, I have a pretty good sense of who you are professionally, but I'm actually more interested in what you do personally. So tell me a little bit about what you do on the weekend. And I said to John, Oh, okay. Well, you know, my wife and I, we don't have kids yet, so I, uh, we, we go to movies a lot. We really enjoy movies, and in fact, we, we like going to the theater and watching movies on their opening weekend. That's one of the things that we like to do. It's sort of our date night. And he says, well, tell me a little bit about the kinds of movies you like to watch. And I started getting excited. I thought to myself, oh, John is somebody who really likes movies, too. Okay, that's great. So I started telling him, well, you know, I, I'm really into science fiction films and and uh, so, you know, I, I tend to, 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 to drag my wife to those kinds of things. And he says, well, tell me about the science fiction movies you like. And I get even more excited. I think, oh, John's actually into science fiction movies. Now we're going to get to, uh, to, to talk about all of, uh, all, all of my favorite kinds of films. So I tell him some of my favorite movies. And I say, what are some of your favorite science fiction movies? And he says, I have no taste for science fiction. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and he says, but I bet you read science fiction. Tell me a little bit about kind of the books you read. And I said, oh, my goodness, great. So he likes to read science fiction. So I start telling him about some of my favorite science fiction authors and books. And then I asked him, what are some of yours? And he says, no, I have no taste for reading science fiction either. And so I thought to myself, this, is, this man is really very interesting. Most people, when they are in a networking conversation, are really only interested in talking about the things that they care about. But what John is doing is he's making a, a concerted effort here to be interested in the things that I'm passionate about uh, just so that he can learn more about me. And I thought that was what he was doing, which was a great practice. And I thought to myself, well, I really like John. Uh, you know, he's, he's uh, definitely a good listener. But a few days later, I learned what John was really doing. He sent me a follow-up email a couple of days later that said, David, I really enjoyed our conversation together, and I hope we have an opportunity to do some business down the road. Um, I took the liberty of buying your favorite science fiction book. You mentioned that you really like this novel, so I've purchased it. It's on its way to my, uh, to my home via Amazon. Um, you know, you didn't ask me, but my favorite kinds of books are biographies. So I've also attached a gift uh, credit to this email that you can use on Amazon. And here are some of my favorite biographies. Why don't you, you know, if you are so inclined, buy one of these books and read it. And then maybe the next time we have lunch, we will be able to talk about our favorite books and we'll compare notes. And then attached to the email was a $20 gift credit to Amazon. Uh, and I was really touched by his gesture. I was also a little embarrassed because he pointed out that I hadn't bothered to ask him what kind of books he likes to read. Uh, so that was a good lesson. But he also um, gave me this gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness that told me that he was listening to what I had to say and he was even willing to invest some time uh, in a 
uh, relationship that was going to go beyond the usual uh, chit chat of professional networking. So anyway, to get to, to cut to the chase here, I did end up reading his bi the biography that he recommended to me. I didn't particularly like it. So the next time we had lunch, we had a good laugh over that. But the most important thing that I want to communicate with you is this. I've been working with law firms and lawyers for over 15 years. I know a lot of lawyers. Um, and I had only met John this one time, but when I received this gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness, when I received this email from him, I was so touched that he immediately jumped to the top of the list of lawyers who I would want to refer a piece of business to. And I was instantly looking for opportunities for John because he had just tipped the scales. He had just done something that was very generous, very thoughtful, and I felt a little bit indebted to him. I felt like, oh, I, I want to repay him for this thoughtfulness. And if I can do it with a referral or a piece of business, then I will absolutely go out of my way to do that. So uh, John and I have become not only good friends, but also very productive uh, business uh, referral partners. And we've done this uh, because in a very short period of time, in fact, it only took John an email and $20 on a, on a gift certificate to accomplish this with me because of this follow-up email that he sent. So I really want to encourage you to think about the follow-up to your networking meetings, because a lot of times what we do is we go, we have the lunch, we say whatever we say, and then we leave the lunch, and we're not even out the door of the restaurant before we're on our phone looking at email, and we've completely forgotten about the person that we just met with. There's very little by way of follow-up unless there was a specific agreed-to agenda uh, that was discussed in the meeting. But we don't do much to nurture the relationship. We basically just forget about that person for the next two or three months until someone emails someone else and we think, oh, right, shoot, I should probably go out and have lunch with them again and see if we're going to get any business this time. So it's a very different way of thinking about networking when you start introducing something like a gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness because it really does start to translate a business relationship into more like a business friendship. So I would encourage you to deepen your existing business relationships efficiently with this gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness. It doesn't take a lot of time. It just takes a little bit of, um, of creativity uh, in terms of what you send to them. By the way, it may not have any monetary value. It could be, um, a, uh, it could be a, a website that you send them that you think they'll find particularly interesting because they talked during their meeting with you about how uh, you know, their daughter is uh, now turning eight and she's really getting interested in baking. And uh, so you want to send some sort of, you know, recipe that kids can, uh, can work with. I mean, that sort of thing didn't take you any time and it's very thoughtful, very personal, uh, and ultimately uh, something that will help to accelerate uh, that relationship uh, in a meaningful way. Okay, so now we need to move to step three here, gaining access to influencers and business decision makers. We've used the four C's to identify a productive referral source. We've used the gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness to deepen the relationship as quickly as we can. Now we've got uh, a vetted and uh, substantial relationship in our network. What do we do with them? Well, we need to make sure that we are being proactive, again, back to that notion of the pendulum swing, in our interactions with our referral source. One of the ways to do this is to search their contacts on LinkedIn. Now, the alternative to this is what most people do, which is that they sit down, they have lunch with the person, they put in another hour, and there's a little bit of, you know, here are the kind of people that I'd like introductions to. And then there's a little bit of brainstorming that goes on. And we hope that the person who, with whom we are meeting will put, uh, will, will have enough recollection of their network that they'll be able to uh, put the dots together and say, oh, David, you know who you should meet? You should meet so-and-so. But a lot of time it doesn't work that way. A lot of times we say, I would like to meet this kind of person, or these are the kinds of matters that my practice uh, tends to work on. So, you know, please let me know if anybody will con who happens to contact you with that need. Well, the chances of per someone contacting them with that need are relatively slim, which is why referrals don't come uh, along as often as we would like. So we have to do a better job of proactively seeking out the relationships that we're interested in 
so that we're going to get the introductions and referrals that we're looking for from our network. LinkedIn is a great way of doing that. We can either search for prospective clients through our LinkedIn network or for other referral sources. Uh, this example is for a prospective client. We simply go in here, we type in, all right, let's say I'm looking for general counsel in mobile technology in that particular sector because those are the kinds of clients that I'm interested in working with. Again, this is just an example. You would uh, fill out this search field however, you, uh, however it's going to align with your practice needs. And then you'll use the advanced search field to make sure you're uh, searching the right location, the region, whatever it might be, the right size company. And let's say you come up with a list of people. Now, LinkedIn is going to provide a list of first-tier connections. These are people with whom you are directly connected who have mobile technology or general counsel as keywords in their profile. Uh, it will also show you second tier and third tier connections, people with whom you aren't directly connected but who you have access to through your network. Well, once you identify, gosh, you know, here we've got this first tier connection, his name is Bobby, and Bobby's a consultant, and I know Bobby pretty well. In fact, I feel comfortable asking Bobby for an introduction to James. James is the gentleman in the black suit and he's the general counsel of a mobile technology company. Well, fantastic. So what I need to do here now is pick up the phone and ask for an introduction. So you're using LinkedIn simply to identify the opportunity. You don't use LinkedIn to actually connect to James because James doesn't know you very well and just because you're connected to Bobby doesn't mean that you have enough context for this connection. So what you would do is you pick up the phone, you'd say, Bobby, hi there, it's David. I understand you're connected to James because I was looking on LinkedIn and I saw the two of you connected. Do you know James well enough to introduce me to him? Perhaps the three of us could have lunch together, uh, or perhaps I could tag along the next time you're going to sit down with James. Uh, perhaps we could figure out a way to get an article that I've written over to James with, uh, you know, a recommendation from you. What do you recommend? What do you think? And what you're doing now is you're brainstorming with Bobby as to the best way to get in front of James. And this is critical because Bobby's the referral source. He has the relationship. He may say, well, you know what, James is not the kind of guy who's going to sit down and have lunch with me, and he's probably even less likely to have lunch with the both of us, but I'll tell you what, James is going to be attending this event uh, next week, and he's invited me to it, and I could bring you as my guest. And now I can introduce you to James in the context of this event, and I think that'll be a much better way to get the two of you connected. So, you know, this way Bobby gets involved in the process, and Bobby is being a much more productive referral source than he would be otherwise. Now, you can imagine that it's highly likely that a month ago you were having lunch with Bobby, and you said to Bobby, Bobby, by the way, you know, my firm does a lot of work in mobile technology. Um, those are the kinds of clients we serve. Please do let me know if you can think of any, you know, productive introductions to send my way. And Bobby scratched his head and he said, all right, you know, nobody's coming to mind right now, but uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I'll keep you in mind. But because we didn't do the proactive due diligence through social media to find out exactly who Bobby knows, we put the burden of our homework on Bobby's shoulders, and of course, we came up with nothing. If you take the time to go onto LinkedIn and find out who Bobby knows and ask Bobby for a specific introduction, it's a lot less work for him, and you're going to find that Bobby's a much more productive referral source for you. So this is how you use LinkedIn to get this to happen. Um, by the way, at some point you're going to find yourself connecting with James, the gentleman that Bobby introduced you to. And so when you do that, make sure that you include a personal note. Uh, don't just use the generic, I want to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn, because remember, you're starting a relationship with James. So you want to be as personal and as, uh, as specific as possible. You might say, oh, I'm working on a blog or an article that you should enjoy. I'd like to send it to you. I also see that we have, you know, so-and-so in common. Uh, you know, reference the common connections, ask them a question, start a dialogue with James using LinkedIn as that initial platform. Well, this means that as you're on LinkedIn, there are a couple of things that you're going to have to keep in mind. One is that you only want to accept invitations from people, LinkedIn invitations from people from whom you are, would be willing to ask for an introduction. So most of us treat LinkedIn as a repository of everyone that we ever have met or could possibly know through any means whatsoever. The fact that you have 500 plus connections is not really helping you all that much whenever it comes time for you to do a search. Because then when you search a few keywords, you end up with a whole lot of strangers showing up on your list, diluting your results and making this process very inefficient. 
It's also very difficult to delegate this process because if you decide you'd like your secretary to do this search for you, your secretary is not going to know which of the people who show up are close enough to you that you would feel comfortable asking them for an introduction. So this work has to be done by you and the more targeted your LinkedIn network, the more uh, productive you will find your results to be. You're going to ask your existing referral sources for introductions to prospective clients, but also to other referral sources. So remember this whole notion of the short list. Well, if Bobby, for instance, has a, a connection to a particular kind of lawyer or professional who you would like to see in your, uh, in your short list of referral sources, then you can ask him about that too. Bobby may have already spent the four years getting to know that person. And he can tell you, oh, this person is very referral-minded, and this person's clients are very high caliber, and this person would be an excellent referral partner for you. And so Bobby can be the person that helps you get through those four Cs more effectively. Again, of course, you would need to go on LinkedIn and make sure that Bobby knows that person. But you're, you're doing the search on Bobby's contacts anyway. You might as well look for some referral sources as well. And then on LinkedIn, uh, you can, LinkedIn shows you who has viewed your profile, who's been looking at you, right? It's like a, it's a great way of spying on the people who've been spying on you. And so what you can do is uh, look at that section of LinkedIn at the people who viewed your profile, and if any of them look interesting in terms of being either a prospective client or prospective referral source, send them an introductory note and ask them how you can be of help. You already know that they have some interest in you. Something had them click on your profile and check you out and, and look into you. Uh, so that's another way that LinkedIn basically walks these opportunities up to your doorstep. But very few people take advantage of LinkedIn for the business networking potential that it truly has. And it, it'll just make your uh, whole process a lot more efficient if you start using it. Okay, so we've used the four C's to identify productive referral sources. We've used the gesture of extraordinary thoughtfulness to deepen them. Uh, we are using LinkedIn to gain access to influencers and business decision makers through our network. This takes us to the fourth and final piece here, which is to implement some follow-up strategies so that we can become more proactive rather than relying on the passive keep me in mind a strategy that most people implement. Um, you know, a, a system is really critical here. For those of you that are a little more comfortable with a uh, traditional way of doing this, a standard spreadsheet is fine. You can just put the name of your referral source. Uh, I call this an ally portfolio because it's sort of like an investment portfolio. You want to make sure that it's balanced, and you might want to make sure that it is uh, yielding a dividend to you. Um, so you would put the name of your person and what is their profession. The reason that you want to name their profession is because you don't want too many people who are, who are in the same line of work because you simply can't feed that many HR consultants. Let's say you are uh, an employment lawyer and HR consultants tend to send you referrals. Well, that's great, but how many referrals do you have for HR consultants? Probably not enough to justify having five or six different people who do the same thing on this short list. So don't get greedy, figure out who are going to be the top two people that I'm going to uh, make sure that I send referrals and introductions to because that's going to make sure that those relationships are sustainable and that they're worth the long-term investment. You might want to identify if this person has potential as an ally or if you've already established them as an ally, uh, and it would probably also be a good idea to identify when was the last time that you had contact with them uh, so that you can say, oh, goodness, I haven't talked to Joe. Uh, since November 12th of last year, uh, it's time for me to reach back out to Joe, schedule a lunch, and make sure that he has a collaborative mindset. Because I'm not exactly sure about that. Or perhaps with Sally Yoon, uh, Sally sent me several referrals. It's time for me to do something for her. I don't have any referrals for her right now, but at the very least, I could introduce her to Bob, uh, and Bob, uh, I think, would be a good connection for her. So you see, this kind of a system helps you to be proactive about thinking of your referral sources and making sure that you're nurturing those relationships effectively. For those of you who are a little more uh, technology uh, oriented, uh, obviously you can use CRM to do this. There's interaction, contact ease. Those are the two market leaders right now in terms of uh, legal CRM in North America. Uh, there's also OnePlace, which is an emerging platform and practice pipeline. 
Um, I'm going to show you what Practice Pipeline looks like. It's a product that my company uh, produces, uh, just so you have an example of how this can be helpful to you. Um, the, 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 the concept behind pipeline management is that you have a very simple dashboard that you're looking at with key relationships. So you would simply identify this as a client or a prospect or a referral source. You would put their company in here. It might be ABC Inc. You would uh, put the name of the person. Maybe it's Mary Smith. Uh, what is your main goal? The main goal might be to send Mary free referrals. Why? Because she sent you uh, several referrals already and it's time for you to offer some quid pro quo. You're going to set that out for uh, end of November. And what's your next step here? Well, you're going to send her three referrals, but maybe the next step is just to sit down and have lunch because you haven't seen her in a while. And if you need to, there's even drop down menus on these kinds of platforms that uh, give you uh, some suggestions. So invite her to lunch and we're going to set this step out for uh, a couple of weeks from now. So what that does is that adds Mary to your dashboard. And now you'll see that here she is. This is a green tile because it's out in the future. The red tiles are the ones that are overdue and that you need to put some attention into. Now, some of these are referral sources like John Summers over at ABC. Uh, some of them are uh, even clients. And uh, these are, uh, you can also use this kind of a system to keep your top clients or top prospective clients uh, in, in your line of sight. Uh, this sort of system usually assigns some sort of score so that you can see how you're doing, perhaps compared to the firm. So again, very simple tool. It's something that you can access on your mobile phone, something you can access online. This is a much simpler platform than CRM, uh, but it's something that I just want you to be aware is out there because whether it, it doesn't matter what system you're using, whether it's a more complicated system like Interaction Contact Ease or something simpler like Practice Pipeline or even something really simple like an Excel spreadsheet. The important thing is that you have some sort of system that you are using, because otherwise you're relying on your memory or you're relying on your referral source to send you an email. And that's a very reactive way of uh, putting, your, putting your referral source into your workflow. Uh, and again, as I say, that, that creates that pendulum swing so that there's nothing that's going to uh, alert you that you need to be more proactive in your thinking in terms of who are the important people on the short list and what are you doing to nurture those relationships. Very good, so that takes us to the uh, conclusion of our agenda here. Uh, we've shown you how to identify productive referral sources and how to deepen them. We've shown you how to use LinkedIn to gain access to influencers. By the way, if, if LinkedIn is not something that you are particularly fond of, I know it's not everyone's uh, favorite platform, you can also do this simply through conversation. Uh, when you sit down with your referral source, you can ask them, hey, listen, I'm looking for introductions to accountants who could be good referral sources for me, or I'm looking for introductions to general counsel of this particular kind of company. Um, can you help me? And, and having those kinds of questions are absolutely appropriate in a referral source uh, context. Remember, a lot of time what people do is they talk about their firm, they talk about their capabilities, and then they say, keep me in mind. They don't actually ask for an introduction. So keep me in mind is a very passive way of getting your referral source to help you out because it doesn't actually give them any kind of call to action. So uh, when you sit down with them, uh, if you really want access to the people in their network, give them some descriptors of what you're looking for. It's helpful to even name sectors. Do you know anyone in mobile technology? Do you know anyone who's at the legal department uh, in a company uh, who um, could perhaps be in a decision-making role in terms of outsourcing legal work. Do you know any entrepreneurs or CEOs of companies um, who you would be comfortable introducing me to so that I can get to know them, get to know their business, and perhaps look for opportunities uh, for us to uh, meet down the road? Now, all of this needs to come from a referral source because, of course, you can't solicit these people directly, especially if they're non-lawyers. So when it's an introduction that's coming through, uh, a mutual connection, uh, that's something that you can absolutely ask a referral source to, to think of, and then the two of you can come up with the best and most appropriate and most ethical means of getting connected to each other. And then, of course, lastly, um, follow-up strategies uh, using systems. You want to make sure you have some sort of system in place, whether it's 
uh, technology driven or something that it goes beyond you relying on your own memory. Remember, uh, the, the, one of the challenges you're going to have with something like an Excel spreadsheet is you still have to remember to go to it. Uh, what technology can do, these various CRM and pipeline management tools will actually send you email reminders and say, hey, you haven't talked to so and so in a little while, why don't you pick up the phone? And uh, that is a little more intrusive in a good way uh, and will make sure that you are being proactive in your outreach to these people because of the reminders that you've set uh, through the CRM and pipeline management platforms. All right, well, we have just a few minutes left on the program, and uh, that gives us some time for Q&A, so I'll turn it over to you, Lindsay. Let me know if uh, there are any questions from the audience, and I'd be happy to address them. Sure, thanks, David, that, that was great. Um, the first question I had that came in was um, whether, I mean, obviously referrals are, are a big part of, um, of our network, and so um, whether you saw a difference between the types of referrals that you're talking about and some of the activities that people should be engaging in if they are a member of a referral network like the ILN um, and, and how that would, would work, um, you know, whether that adds another layer or, or how they would, would address that. So how they would uh, leverage their uh, membership in an association for referral activity? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think like any of these things that we've talked about today, um, the more proactive you are, the more results that you'll see. So you really have to participate and invest yourself into it in order to get something out of it. Um, I, I think that being very specific about your requests through the network, uh, again, will, will help you get more results. So knowing what to ask for. You know, the firm is currently looking to expand uh, its focus into this new business sector. Does anyone, uh, can anyone connect me to people who are working in that sector or who have had some success in that sector or referral sources in that sector? That's a very specific uh, request that is more likely to get a response. It also can be a fairly non-threatening request because I don't have to t uh, introduce you to my prospective client if the only way I know you is through ILM, for instance. I could introduce you to a consultant, or I could introduce you to uh, someone who I feel is an influencer in that sector, but who isn't going to necessarily cost me uh, a, an opportunity for my practice. So, you know, when you're looking at a lawyer-centric network, you have to be considerate of the fact that the other lawyers have their own uh, agenda uh, that they're going to be focused on, and so they're not going to put their needs uh, behind yours. Um, but if you're making requests that not only advance uh, your uh, objectives, but uh, also do so in a way that are respectful to theirs, you're more likely to get um, a, a response from them. Um, I don't know a lot about the ILN resources. In fact, this might be an opportunity, Lindsay, if you just want to say a word or two about the kinds of forums that ILN provides so that people can put requests into the network and can use, um, you know, the, the referral potential that exists through ILN more effectively, uh, this could be a nice segue for that. Sure. Um, actually, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, we have a few different ways that, that people can leverage the network. Um, obviously, the primary one for us is uh, our conferences. Um, we have four conferences a year. We have our, our international meeting, which is generally in May or early June. Next year, it will be in Boston. We're getting ready to send out our save the date for that. Our, our host firm will be Davis, Mom, and Diocene. We have uh, an Asia Pacific, um, an Americas, and a European regional meeting also. And the regional meetings are actually quite interesting because while they do generally see most, we see most of our participants being regional um, from that region, we do also see some crossover from other regions, and that can be a great way to showcase your firm if you're from outside the region and doing business there because um, you're sort of a big fish in a small pond. So those are, those are good opportunities. Um, we also offer, um, we have several LinkedIn groups. Uh, we have one main group that works for the, the ILN as a whole, and then we also subdivide that among some of our specialty groups. Um, and our specialty groups themselves actually are, are quite an excellent opportunity. Um, we 
although we're not restricted by those groups, uh, we have um, obviously where most of our firms are, are full service firms and, and that ranges across a number of practice areas. Uh, we have these 13 specialty or 14 now specialty groups that um, are segmented in practice and industry areas that allow lawyers um, in, a, in a broader range of areas within network firms to get to know each other a little bit better and engage so that um, there can be some some more knowledge going back and forth between the members um, around the world. So that's a really great opportunity too. And those groups do varying things. Um, they meet at, at industry conferences. They meet at our conferences. They have conference calls and work on papers together and, and a few other things. We've got one group with a blog. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities there for them. Um, and then we, we try and back that up with some of the, the social networking that they can do through, um, through LinkedIn, through their groups, and, um, and also through some of the showcase pages that we use. Um, and then we, we recommend what we call one of our programs um, we've nicknamed uh, Travelin, um, which is Travel ILN. And, uh, and that's the recommendation that whenever anybody's traveling for business or, or pleasure um, to another city uh, where there's an ILN member, either let us or, or directly the member there know. Um, and it's an opportunity to meet the, the people in the office there, um, stop in and, and meet their colleagues or, um, or the ILN uh, members uh, there so that they can um, they can start the relationship um, with that firm if they haven't gotten the opportunity to meet them before and uh, and you know meet some more more people on a regular basis um, and it, it's a different view when you get to see the the office of the network member in their home city um, and they, you know this, everybody is very hospitable in the network so that's really excellent. That's great, Lindsay. Thank you. And a couple of things I want to touch on with that. You know, when you're networking through uh, a community like ILN, one of the things that you're looking for is the degree to which they have opportunities. Again, this goes back to that commerce potential that would be outside of their region and perhaps in yours. Because in many cases, the firms do similar things, but they just do them in different parts of the world. So, you know, that's part of what you're assessing is how much work do you send to, to tend to send overseas or uh, across the border? And, uh, you know, this is what our potential looks like in terms of what we can do to make sure that we're being uh, productive to you. You also mentioned that, you know, sometimes firms work together on white papers or blogs. I think it's a, a, a really uh, excellent forum in which to stay proactive with each other because the fact that you're working on something together will be an excuse to pick up the phone, stay in communication, and uh, as we said earlier, have that system that engages regular communication. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I think is really important is that, you know, these four C's that we just talked about absolutely apply when you're attending a conference at uh, ILN. Again, you're going to meet a whole bunch of people. You'll have a pocket full of business cards or a purse full of business cards by the end of the conference. But as you're having all of those conversations, make sure that you're asking the kinds of questions that help you identify, is this someone that I want to have uh, an extended relationship with? And I know a lot of the examples I gave today were things like lunch, and breakfast, and drinks, and that's difficult to do if you're networking with a firm that's, you know, a thousand miles or 10,000 miles away from you. But uh, I think, uh, you know, escalating your communication with them so that at least you're on the phone or you're having a Skype call uh, on a regular basis uh, can take the place of this lunch. And it doesn't have to take long. Hey, listen, we haven't talked in a couple of months. Uh, let's schedule a five-minute call. I want to see what you're up to, what you're working on these days. I'll share some of the things that I'm working on. And let's just stay in the dialogue. You don't have to have a referral or an introduction to send to them to um, propose that kind of connection. If you have a short list of referral sources and they are geographically far away from you, uh, then work the time into your calendar for these kinds of touch base calls because emails and, you know, texts and social media and all of that is pretty meaningless in terms of deepening a, deepening a relationship. It's a way to just ping them and stay on their radar but you're not going to advance the relationship meaningfully unless you're actually in some sort of dialogue. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, that requires a little more of an investment of time, but it also yields a much higher dividend in terms of the likelihood of that person to think of you first when an opportunity crosses their desk. Right, right, we would totally agree. Um, we had one other question come in. Um, if you could repeat the network management tools slash apps. 
Sure. Let me go back to that slide. So interaction and contact ease are the two leading CRM platforms um, in legal right now in North America. They're, they're very robust programs. They have database management, email management, event management. So there's a lot that, that comes with that. Um, if all you're looking for pipeline is pipeline management, which is the example that I showed you with Practice Pipeline, then you probably want to focus on one place or Practice Pipeline. They're more recent um, additions to the market, so they're much more streamlined uh, and a lot more user-friendly, a lot more intuitive uh, and mobile-friendly. Um, they, they accomplish less in terms of managing your entire law firm's database, but if really what you're looking for is a tool that's going to help you manage that shortlist, then you'll find that those two platforms are going to be um, a little more effective. It, ultimately, I would say go to all of their websites, you know, look, for the, look at the demos, uh, make your own assessment, because you're going to know what's going to work best with the culture of your firm uh, and, uh, you know, with the kinds of uh, uh, attitudes that uh, all of us see uh, in, our, in our unique workplaces. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and as always, um, David is available by email. Um, if anybody has any questions for him, and I'll circulate that information after the webinar. Um, we will be also circulating the slides um, in PDF format and a recording of the webinar in the next day or two. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be hosting our fourth and final webinar in this series with David on August 11th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And that webinar will cover how to motivate the next generation of rainmakers. So we look forward to speaking with David next month. And if anybody has any questions on this or any of our other activities, please feel free to reach out to either myself or David. And we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks again.